So today, we're honoured to introduce um, our speaker today, Mufti Ismail Man, who was born in Harare, in Zimbabwe, and was tutored by his father, who is a well-known scholar in Thai. After completing his hifth and recitation courses at an early age, he studied Sharia under his father. He then attained a degree in Sharia from the University of Medina and later specialised at Darul Uloom and Tariya in Gujarat. He teaches at the, at the Darul Uloom Adar al Ilm in Harare and attends many international religious conferences. Um, so we're just going to start with their recitation for today. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنازعات غرقا والناشطات نشطا والسابحات سبحا فالسابقات سبقا فالمدبرات أمرا يوم ترجف الراجفة تتبعها الرادفة قلوب يومئذ واجفة أبصارها خاشعة يقولون أئنا لمردودون في الحافرة أئذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة هل أتاك حديث موسى إذ ناداه ربه بالوادي المقدس طوى اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى وأهديك إلى ربك فتخشى فأراه الآية الكبرى فكذب وعصى ثم أدبر يسعى فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى فأخذه الله نكال الآخرة والأولى إن في ذلك لعبرة لمن يخشى أأنتم أشد خلقا أم السماء بناها رفع سمكها فسواها وأغطش ليلها وأخرج ضحاها والأرض بعد ذلك دحاها أخرج منها ماءها ومرعاها والجبال أرساها متاعا لكم ولأنعامكم فإذا جاء الجحيم لمن يرى فأما من طغى وآثر الحياة الدنيا فإن الجحيم هي المأوى وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى يسألونك عن الساعة أيام مرساها فيما أنت من ذكراها إلى ربك منتهاها إنما أنت منذر من يخشاها كأنه يوم يرونها لم يلبثوا لم يلبثوا 
أو ضحاها صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عباده الذين اصطفى وبعد We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad may peace be upon him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah bless his entire household may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all his companions and all those who have struggled and strived to bring the deen to us may he also bless us all and may he bless our offspring those to come up to the day of qiyamah my beloved brothers and sisters we are gathered here today so that we can feel like we're muslims inshallah and so that we can feel like we're good muslims inshallah i don't think there is anyone here who does not love allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who does not want the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we are gathered here i know the topic i was given was connected to temptations and i'll try to stick to it although it is very tempting not to <laughs> what we need to know is mashallah the deen is very simple very easy what we need to know is we find ourselves in circumstances that surround us we need to make the most of the circumstances on condition that we are pleasing the creator so we are at varsity here mashallah i think the bulk of us here are students at the university what we need to realize is seize the opportunity of your life at the varsity to maximize on your benefit why are you here you are here in order to study a certain field be focused and inshallah you will achieve whenever you are dilly dallying or whenever you are losing focus remind yourself once again and come back to the path a winner is the one who, whenever they lose the path slightly, they quickly come back. That's the winner. Because we are human beings. And from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, human beings err. We are told that we make mistakes, we commit sins, we make errors. But the winner is the one who turns. Let me mention a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which many of you may know. He says, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, kullu bani adam khatta wa khayru khattaina at-tawabun. All the children of Adam are prone to error. They make mistakes, all of them. And the best of those who make mistakes are those who constantly repent. And a tawab is not like a ta'ib. If who knows the Arabic language will be able to tell that there is a difference between a ta'ib and a tawab. The one who repents once is ta'ib. And the one who constantly repents is known as tawab. So there are so many things that happen to us there are so many things that we find living here in Britain, living in, you know, what is known as the free world, so to speak, that according to the law of the land may not be wrong. If I were to put a tattoo on my forehead, from a British point of view, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think if David Cameron was to put a tattoo on his forehead and have an earring on one of his ears and talk to you like this, nobody would vote for him. Do you agree? Do you agree? So they know themselves and everyone knows and I know, mashallah, and that is good, that yes, although people are free according to the law of the land, to do what they want, mashallah, we do know that there is a certain limit beyond which you are now known as a different type of a person. Subhanallah. You're now known as a different type of a person. There are consequences for your decisions. You will decide, but there are consequences that you will have to live by. You want to have a very, very big tattoo, mashallah, somewhere that is noticeable by everyone. Yes, you might enjoy the fact that this guy is a hard guy, so to speak, you know, but you will have to live with it in the future. When you want to turn to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there might come a day when you will feel so low because you've done something that is more or less irreversible. Like a person who, for example, chooses a spouse based solely on good looks, mashallah. The day the first wrinkles begin to appear, they start looking for a new model, mashallah. Why? Because that was what they chose. We need to know when you look for a spouse, you're taught what to look for. If you don't want to look for those things, no problem. You will still get married and you may even be happy, mashallah. But you will have to live with the consequences of your decisions. And this is something very important. Now, whilst you are at varsity, there are certain decisions you have to make. There are certain things you have to achieve. There is a field that you have to work within in order to try and qualify so that you did not waste your parents' monies. I'm sure our parents and those who are sponsoring us have spent thousands of pounds on us. Some of them have worked day and night in order to send us to a place like this 
Why then should we waste our time, money, energies, efforts and theirs doing something else totally? It's important for us to be focused. I'd like to dive straight into some of the temptations. I think we all know that the temptations are very, very great. You know, if you were to name, if I were to say, what are the temptations you have here at the Varsities, for example, or even in Britain, so to speak, you have women, number one. When I say women, I'm talking of the opposite sex. It's a temptation in the sense that there's a right way of doing things, there's a wrong way of doing things. You may want to know one another for the right reasons, and you may want to know one another for the wrong reasons. You may fall in love with something that you're not supposed to be falling in love with, and you may fall in love with something you are supposed to be falling in love with. So you need to know that there is an Islamic way of resolving a matter. Allah has created within all, both sexes, a base desire. That base desire is natural. Believe me, if that base desire is to be fulfilled in a manner that pleases Allah, it becomes an act of worship. And if it is to be fulfilled in the wrong way, let me tell you what happens. Yes, it might be rosy, mashallah, for how long? For a little while. And then what happens? We need to suffer, or we may suffer the consequences of our own decisions. We decided to do something. One day when we feel low and cheap and useless, and you know, we feel like we really wasted our life and so on, it sometimes is a consequence of our own decisions, what we chose, and that's what we get in return. So for every action, there is a reaction. For every decision, there is a consequence. Sometimes it's your right. Like I tell people, you know, to be a gay, it's your British right. Believe me, it's your British right. But it's also your right to choose your religion. And if you've chosen a religion that disallows it within yourself, you will not allow yourself to enter that territory. So, mashallah, it's very sensible. We don't need to look at someone who's gay and start, you know, spitting in their direction because we may be jailed. It will happen, I'm sure. But we look at them as more their doubt. I don't know if you would agree with me. Which means someone whom you can talk to and you can tell them, you know, brother, what do you think? And you can discuss it with them. Be careful. Make sure they are not from amongst those whom, you know, any little thing they'll say you are, what do they call it? Abusing me, mashallah. Or you are, uh, I don't know, now that they protect it so much that even if you give them a look, they'll probably get you jailed. Allah protect us. So we need to know that we should look at people and reflect within our own condition. I'm so lucky, mashallah, so fortunate. I have the guidance of a religion. I may not be the most perfect Muslim, but I am trying. Yesterday I spoke, I think it was in Glasgow. Yes, it was, mashallah, so many places we've been to, we don't even remember. But I remember saying yesterday that if you have a student in a classroom of 20 who was number 18 out of 20, and you have another one who was number 2 out of 20, when the term or the semester is finished, the one who was 18 comes up to, say, 6 or 9, and the one who was 2 remains at 2. Be honest with me, who has made a bigger effort? The one who was 18. So, he has not yet got to number 2, but wallahi, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has made a much, much, much bigger effort. The same applies to Muslims, myself and yourselves. We might be so weak, we might have so many weaknesses. I might have 50 things wrong with me. If I worked with 25 over a period of two years, inshallah, in the eyes of Allah, I may be better than the one who has not worked on any of his weaknesses, but he's only sitting with 10 weaknesses. I hope you understand the difference. So never judge a book by its cover. There are people who might not appear to be the best of Muslims, but their struggle to gain the love of their maker is far greater than those who may appear to be the best of Muslims. And this is why, be careful. Be careful how you look at others. And be careful how you pass statements of judgment. How you speak to people. Because it is very tempting to look at people and to say, Ah, oh, this one's almost out of the fold of Islam. Billah. Who am I? I may end my life in a condition that I may not be, have, be as loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the very people whom I thought were almost close to exiting the fold. A'udhu Billah. And this is very, very tempting when it comes to varsity life, when we have people from different countries, different backgrounds, different probably sects of Islam and so on, and you have people who just label, you know, that one there, sorry I'm pointing at the ceiling there, don't worry. That one there is, belongs to this group, and that one there is out of the fold. And this sister, no hijab, no niqab, miniskirt, going to Jahannam, Allahu Akbar. Yet only Allah knows what is her own link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why must I be judgmental? For what? My job is to try 
to make everyone feel that, you know what, we are actually good Muslims, we need to try our best to make the most of our days in the dunya because they are numbered, they are limited, and every day that passes is actually one day less. Every day that passes is one day less. So I need to know that Allah has blessed me, and Allah has blessed me with the guidance. That's why we are seated here. We all want to hear something that will motivate us, and I hope it is motivating us. Now we have temptations. Temptations of what? You know you have the clubs, mashallah. You have the nightlife. Nightlife is very tempting, very glamorous, mashallah. Why tempting? Because it's the in thing. Everybody does it. I was speaking to a brother from Yemen yesterday, and he told me there is something known as al-qat. I don't know if some of you might know it. It's a bit more like, I don't know if I can say it, but just to put it closer to your mind, a bit like the weed that some people smoke. This thing is something that you chew, and it keeps you a little bit like a Red Bull, you know? So basically, he was saying, you know, if you want to join the youth and you want to be accepted in Yemen, you need to be chewing al qat. And uh, anyway, the discussion continued. But the point I want to make is, if you want to be acceptable to your peers, you may need to go into what is known as the nightlife. Allahu Akbar. So tempting and so pressurizing. But if we do do that, we're just one more. We're just a number. We just carry on with everyone else. And that's it. How many years are we going to be here for? Not more than six, I think. Not more than seven. Unless you failed a few times, Allah protect us. You might be here for a bit longer. Unless you've gone higher also, let's look at it more positively. Unless you've decided to do a PhD and what have you, you might be here for much longer. But, once you've dropped once, and you don't realize and regret, what will happen? It will be much easier to drop again and again and again. But, you can protect yourself for as long as you can and by the will of Allah you will be able to feel over a period of time the connection with the maker, the connection with Allah. You will have like-minded people and this is why one of the most powerful ways of protecting ourselves from the temptations around us is to choose the best company. To choose the best company, like-minded people who think alike who speak in a way that is either better than ourselves or similar, who have similar thinking and so on, or better. And inshallah, by being in their company, we will be able to help ourselves stay away from the temptations that are wrong. When it comes to time of salah, we are with five sisters, mashallah. I'm talking here about the sisters, not one brother with five sisters, no. But five sisters, mashallah, and what happens to the sisters? The, all of them, four of them say, you know, let's read salah. The fifth one won't say, no, I'm not. She just nod her head. Yet, maybe in her own little private life, she wouldn't have been that regular with Salah. What happened? We saved ourselves with so much ease because we were with the right people. It's very more difficult to read Salah when you're alone, when you're not regular, than when you're with a group of people, all of them are going to read it anyway. You want to go to a restaurant and you're not really, really bothered about halal and haram, but the four people you are with are bothered about it. Do you think someone will say, sisters, don't bother, man. Pork or no pork? Let's go and have a nice chow, a nice meal. No, they won't. Nobody's going to say that. So you get saved automatically. Automatically saved. Why? Because of your company. You know, if I were to talk about company this evening, wallahi, we could speak for two hours and valid, solid points. How the Quran speaks about the company. What powerful verses of Surah Al Furqan? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the day of Qiyamah, those who will have had bad company will be really eating their hands. That means they will be regretting it so badly, saying, Oh, we wish we would have chosen the path of the messenger. And we wish we didn't have so and so as a friend, so and so as a friend, because they led us astray after we knew what was right and what was wrong. Some of us are from very good backgrounds, but because of the friends we have, it becomes irrelevant what background we come from. We now have a new sort of identity, and when we go home, we have the half bummers. You know what's the half bummer? I'm sure you've heard it before. The genes that come halfway down the backside, mashallah. Halfway down the backside. And we are supposed to be going to the masjid, so what happens? We walk to the masjid, we have a balance. You know, I can actually show you, I can strut up there and back. Show you exactly how it looks. And we have two fingers coming in now and again as though we're cutting a piece of paper that doesn't exist. 
So what happens? We walk up and down, and we go to the masjid, and when we're going to sujood, you hear the brother behind you saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, instead of me going down to sajda. But this is happening. Yet, before we left home, it wasn't the case. Why? Because we gave up. We gave up our good qualities for the bad qualities of those around us. So, that brings me straight to the next point. The issue of dress code. Wallahi, it is so tempting to just, you know, dress like everybody else does, you know, no bothering of anything. Wallahi, it is our duty. We would like to taste halawat al-iman, the sweetness of iman, the link of your maker. Imagine if you could actually taste that Allah is with me and Allah is protecting me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly by me. You know you need to read the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was the most loved and he went through so many difficulties. So going through difficulties does not necessarily mean that Allah does not like you. No. Going through difficulties with contentment is such a great sign. When Allah loves you, He puts difficulty in your life. Yesterday I spoke about a brother, a friend of mine. He told me many years ago that I've never had the reason to call out to Allah. He's always given me absolutely everything. Until one day, something came crashing. And I realized it's the first time in my life, 25 years down the line, that I actually raised my hand and said, Ya Allah, I actually need you now. I told him, brother, that's a gift of Allah. He loves you so much that He did something to you so that you can get close to Him. Imagine, let me give you a typical example of a Romeo and Juliet scenario. Listen, you have a guy who desperately wants to attract the attention of a certain woman or a certain girl. What happens? He'll fiddle. He'll do something silly. He just wants to attract attention. Why? Because he knows, I just need a bit of attention. That we understand. It's a totally opposite example. It's something of the dunya that everybody knows. When you love someone, you've got a crush on them. For example, you really want them to look at you. Even a little glimpse. Wow, oh, that was my day made, mashallah. You know, you go back home, you're smiling with everybody. Nobody knows why. Oh, she looked at me. Wow. You know that? So imagine that is exactly what people think, how they think sometimes. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has what we know as walillahi al a'la. The example is far higher than that I've just given you now. But to bring it closer to the mind, I gave you this example. When Allah loves you, He does something to bring you closer to Him. That's a sign of top love, mashallah. Allahu Akbar. Allah loves you. That's why He put difficulty in your life. This is why the hadith clearly says, Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalahu. When Allah loves someone, He tests them a bit more. So you have more tests. But brother, this is going wrong. That's going wrong. This is going wrong. Nothing is going wrong. It's Allah who wants you to turn to Him. Just continue making dua to Allah. Turn to Allah. People have problems. Listen, we have examinations. Don't we? MashaAllah. Exam time, what do we do? Suddenly, the Quran comes out. The Musalla comes out. MashaAllah. Everything. Allah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim MashaAllah Why? When we Ya Allah Examination tomorrow Help me out I promise you this I promise you that You wrote the examination What happens? Results come out A's ah, Guys let's go clubbing man <laughs> We passed We got a party Don't we? That is so tempting But this is why the Quran says that when man is affected with difficulty, he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we give man goodness, he turns away. He turns away to his sides. As though, subhanallah, he was never affected by anything. And Allah says, when we test him, When we test him, when evil touches him, he makes the broadest of du'as. Oh, for hours of end, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, look at what has happened. Ya Allah, help me, help me, help me. And Allah says, hang on, isn't it such a beautiful condition? You love me, you're worshipping me, your levels of sincerity are so high. What if I kept you like this all your life? Wouldn't you enter paradise automatically? Subhanallah, look at what we've got in store. But we don't look at it that way. How do we look at it? Oh, is this a punishment? I said, well, it's the love of Allah. You've got to look at it that way. So, as I say, mashallah, you know, we have uh, times, uh, there is a specific verse about examinations. We can translate it that way, where Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, 
أولا يرون أنهم يفتنون في كل عام مرة أو مرتين ثم لا يتوبون ولا هم يذكرون Do they not see that we test them very strongly once or twice in the year? They still don't want to repent, they still don't want to take heed. Allahu Akbar. Aren't we tested once or twice in the year with big, big examinations? And then we still don't want to repent, we still don't want to take heed. What do we expect? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Allah through His mercy still grants us goodness even though sometimes we don't deserve it. So the issue of peer pressure is very, very real. Very real. To be accepted by others, to be greeted by them. We sometimes can discard our own Islamic values and principles just to be accepted by people. So you have a brother, mashallah, you know, uh, he has maybe, for example, uh, dressed Islamically or possibly he visits the masjid regularly and then he has a certain group of people who don't read Salah at all and he's the only one. And then he starts mixing with them. What happens? If he's not careful, he might end up giving up his Salah. And if we do that, it has what I called moments ago, subhanallah, an impact. It has a reaction. There is a repercussion. There is something that we will have to live with because of the decisions we've made. I didn't read salah. What happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. He's upset. He's waiting for me to turn. Which means if a person does, commits a sin, remember one thing. We as Muslims look at it as follows. If a person commits a sin, they still have hope on condition that they turn back to Allah. I want to say that again. If a person commits a sin, they still have hope on condition that they turn back to Allah immediately. There is a, a verse in the Quran which speaks about adultery and which speaks about other sins. And Allah says, if you turn to Allah after that, Allah says, those are the people we will give Jannah to. Those who've turned. Listen to the verse. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ Those who have committed immorality, an act of immorality which includes adultery, or they have oppressed themselves in one way or another, meaning they've sinned, ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately after that, they regret. What makes you regret? The hadith says, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَتُكَ وَسَعَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنٍ when your good deed makes you feel good and your bad deed makes you regret, it's a sign of Iman. It's a sign that you're a mu'min because if you did not have that answerability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where would you feel guilty after committing a sin? So if you've committed a sin and you think to yourself, I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? That's a sign that Allah loves you. It's a sign that Allah has still given you that flicker of Iman. You have the answerability in your heart. It's a good sign. But with that, you need to turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, forgive me. And Allah says, those who seek forgiveness in the verse I read, He says, They remembered Allah and they sought forgiveness. Saying, who can forgive the sin besides Allah? No one. We don't have a Rabb besides Allah. Allah is our maker. The maker, the nourisher, the cherisher. I always tell people, and it's something very interesting, that you know the word Allah. A lot of the non-Muslims hear it and they think, oh, these people worship maybe a black box. Maybe a stone, maybe, you know, something is funny. No, Allah is from Ali Hayatlahu. It is from the Arabic root to worship. And Allah is Al Ma'loo. Al Ma'loo means the worshipped one. So, what I am saying in effect is Allah, the worshipped one. Who is the worshipped one? Rabbun. The one who made, the one who nourishes, cherishes, sustains, provides for, protects. The one with absolute control of all creation. I call him the worshipped one. He alone deserves to be worshipped. What powerful concept of Godhood in Islam. Nobody can argue with it. No one. If I were to tell you that we worship our maker alone, who can argue with that? No one. If I tell you I put my head on the ground solely for my maker, when I say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, do you know what I'm saying? All praise is due to, or glory be to, my Rabb, my Rabb meaning my creator, the one who made me, who is the highest. What a powerful statement, subhanAllah. What a powerful statement. The one who made me, for him I put my head on the ground, for no one else. Allahu Akbar. So, this verse, we are saying that Allah, the maker, will forgive us. Who is there that we have who will forgive us besides our own maker? The one whom we are going to return to. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, وَلَمْ يُصِرُوا عَلَى مَا 
آمَنُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And if these people leave their sins and do not continue committing the sin whilst knowing, knowingly, intentionally, continuing committing the sins, they don't do that, Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ For those people, they will receive forgiveness from their heart. وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ Allah Akbar. They will be granted paradise. Beneath which rivers will be flowing of all sorts and there is a description of Jannah MashaAllah. And what a great abode for those who have done good deeds. So a good deed is not only a deed like salah and zakah and so on, but to leave that which is so tempting for the pleasure of your maker is a brilliant deed to the degree that in another place in the Quran, I think it is Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Allahu Akbar those who have been committing sins for so long and repent and leave everything for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from that day do good deeds, Allah says we take all the bad deeds and we convert them into good deeds on the right side of the scale so when they get onto the day of Qiyamah, they will see Hajj, they will see Zakah, they will see Salah that they did not fulfill and they will say, Ya Allah, where are these deeds from? And Allah will say, La dhulman yawm, no oppression today. Those are your sins. After your repentance, we converted them into good deeds and this verse is in the Quran. How, how then can we lose hope? The mercy of Allah. How then can we lose hope in the mercy of Allah? He loves every one of us. Every one of us, without exception. No one. There is no exception. And we have access to him, equal access. Just like I have access to him, so do you. And so do all the sisters. And so do the brothers. And so does everyone else. We have access. But let's make use of that access. Today, if you knew, mashallah, the Prime Minister of Britain, if he was just a phone call away, what would happen? We're a big deal. People would want to know us. Mashallah, isn't it? Because a very, very important person, we've got access to them any time of the day or night. Everyone would want to know us. We have access to the maker of the entire creation. What do we do with it? Inshallah, let's do something about it. So, to leave bad company for the pleasure of the creator is something that is called for. The consequence of being in bad company is dangerous. Like I said, we need to ask ourselves, this is where I am. This is my condition today. Where would I like to get to? Sometimes we don't even know where we want to get to. We don't even have a plan. We don't even know what we'd like to achieve. But we all should be saying, I want to get to somewhere higher. In the same way that in this world, we are studying. For what? In order to get a job. In order to get a job to do what? To serve humanity. That's a noble, mashallah. And to earn a salary. And to live for how many more years? To live for another 30 years, I think, after graduation. After we are settled in properly. Another 30 years, maximum 40, maybe. You know, if, you're, if you graduate at 25, 30, by the time you settle down in your own business, everything is yours, you'd probably be about 35, 40. How many more years do you have to live? I think another 30, 40 years, not more. Basically, the average is 60 to 70. So we came to the varsity. We learned for so many years in order to live for an equal number of years. Then, what happens? Can you say, I was at Leeds. Jibril, I was at Leeds. Now I'm in my grave. See that certificate? Yeah, I was there. I had a good talk one day, you know. Yeah, I need Jannah, you know. That's not going to help us. Not at all. But if we were dedicated, we helped people get one inch closer to Allah whilst we were at varsity. Wallahi al-Azim, I tell you, that will come to save us in our graves and in the Akhirah. And believe me, as Muslimin, what is one of the core beliefs? Life after death. That's why we will protect ourselves from being gay. We will protect ourselves from tattooing our foreheads. We'll, the, the, the brothers, inshallah, will protect themselves from wearing these earrings and so on, jewelries and half bummers and so on. Allah safeguard us all. I don't know what you call it. I've just developed a name because that's what it looks like. <laughs> so, so to be honest with you, yesterday we had a brother in Glasgow. Mashallah, I see this brother had a big earring and he came to me. Very, very good brother. Really good. He asked me a few questions and I answered him with his few questions, mashallah. 
And guess what he did? He removed his earring and said, I've been wearing this since the age of eight. From today, no more. I said, Wallahi, if it's for the pleasure of Allah, this might be your Jannah. Wallahi. Allah is looking for one little thing, one small little thing that was so hard for you to do that you've done solely to please Him. And Allah says, you know what? I don't want to look at your salah, your zakah, your what, 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 what. There's one deed that I'm so happy with, just going to paradise. I'm sure you know the hadith of the prostitute who fed or who quenched the thirst of a little dog. SubhanAllah. What happened? Allah says, according to the hadith that was narrated to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she achieved Jannah in return for the compassion that she had for a dog when it was dying. Allahu Akbar. What does that mean? The moral of that story is, do not underestimate the value of a small speck of a deed. Do not underestimate the value of a little speck of a, of a deed. This is why I firmly believe, do not judge books by their covers. You know, you might have a brother who might you know, look like he's one of the clubbers and so on. But believe me, his link with Allah might be higher than someone who may appear to be so religious. And the same applies with the sisters. I am one. Wallahi, I have no judgment. I have a non-judgment policy. Nobody. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. Let's move to something that is also tempting. It's very tempting, wallahi, nowadays to gossip, to want to know things, to backbite. To talk about people behind their backs without realizing that wallahi it's a major major sin it has a consequence when we backbite when we engage in a sin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that is so bad there is a narration which says it is worse than committing adultery why because when you've committed adultery you ask allah to forgive you when i've harmed someone else i need to go to them allah is ghafoor rahim most forgiving most merciful the person i've backbitten about is not ghafoor rahim they may not want to forgive me why that bite? Do you know why gossiping and that is not allowed? We are now engaging in someone else's life in a way that we do not lead our own lives. I need a 24 hour day to rectify my weaknesses. I don't have one moment to go into the lives of others. So if I do go into their lives, it means I'm already lacking in my own life. Simple. So why should I talk about you? For what? I really should not be doing that. I must be worried about my own. The narration says, Tuba liman shagalahu aibuhu an ayubin nas. You know, Tuba is also a place in Jannah. So you could translate this hadith as give good news of paradise to the one whose own weaknesses keeps him or her occupied from engaging in the weaknesses of others. There we are. If you have a chance, mashallah, to talk in such a way that you know you can encourage people to do good, mashallah, that's good. But you do not say, Oh, you know, oh these people, what happened to them? You know, that sister. Amazing. I seen her in the nightclub. And you know what? She was drunk. And this happened. Well, what is, number one is what were you doing there? <laughs> you know, there was there was a brother. There was a brother who came back to us once and he said, Oh, I went to this party, and these people did this, and there were all these naked women, and they were dancing, and they were this and that and that. And I looked at him, we were sitting a few youngsters, and I said, But why did you go there? <laughs> so he thought for a moment and he says, Well, I had to bring back the news to you guys. <laughs> So, so it, that's how we justify our bad deeds sometimes. Wallahi, why talk about them? Get yourself out of there. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. May He grant us goodness. Really, we all have our own link with our Creator. Let's develop it. I think it is very tempting. Laziness is also very tempting. If you, if you look at how I'm trying to word this. You see, it is tempting to sometimes stay asleep when the time of salah clocks in. And 10 minutes later is the time for us to go to varsity and then we'll get up, mashallah. What happens? You know, technology is so advanced these days that I've already spoken to a few people who constantly visit China and so on to say, please tell them to develop a mattress that as soon as the time of salah comes, it springs you up, you know. And you're going to just come up and you try and get back. It says, no, you've got to read your salah. We ask Allah to grant us goodness. It is something that is so great. Salah is something Allah is asking you for. He says he, he really doesn't ask us for much. He's given us our lives, our noses, our ears, our, the faculties of hearing and, and you know seeing and health and the digestive system and absolutely everything and our looks and our hair and our you know everything else we have, the brains and all. And he says, look, I'd like you to just do a set of things. This is all I want. That's it. And we said, yeah, you know, I'm going to think about it. I'll see. I'm not yet ready. You know, I'm weak. I, I make two. It's fine. You know. And then when we have a problem, we say, Ya Allah, help me here and help me there. And Allah says, you know, I'll still give it to you, but I want you to think about something. What is it? I don't need you. 
When I call out to you, you don't want to listen. And when you call out to me, you expect me to respond to you immediately. Through my mercy, I still will give you what you want. But consider what you're going to lose. Allahu Akbar. So let's understand. Salah is very, very important. Very important. We have the temptation of alcohol, also connected to your peers. And also connected to trying to be accepted by people. Trying to be accepted by the others, you know. Wanting to be cool. Wallahi, that coolness will result in the heat of the day of Qiyamah. You can be as cool as you can and you want to be within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can. MashaAllah. So we need to know that if people pass derogatory comments against you that oh this person is a that and a this and you know, you know they call us names, I don't know this part of the world, but back at home, you know, a woman who is covering her face, for example, she will be called a ninja and somebody else will be called a Taliban and somebody else will be called a this and a that. Don't worry, ignore that. Don't even let it frustrate you. Consider it a gift of Allah. You know, I had one scholar in Medina Manawara who used to say, if, if, the, if the people of, you know, the Aqaliyyat, the people of the countries where uh, Islam is not predominant, if they want to know that they are dressed properly, they need to have had someone laugh at them or scoff at them at some time in their lives. That's it. So if someone has laughed at your dress code, yeah, you know, you know that, mashallah, at least I'm doing the right thing. Because we're not like everybody else. Allah grant us strength. And Allah make us from those who are proud Muslims. When I say proud Muslims, be proud of your identity, your name. If your name is a solid name, Alhamdulillah, use it. And make it clear you're a Muslim. So many times we have Christians who help. And when you, when you say thank you very much, they say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. Meaning Christianity prodded me to help you. Why don't Muslims say that? Is it because we don't help? Is it because we are not humanitarian? Well, we are supposed to be. You know, we should be assisting Muslims and non-Muslims, not just Muslims. There, there is this misconception that, you know, the, the non-Muslims are enemies of Islam, they're supposed to be fought, they're supposed to be this and that. A lot of them are just purely ignorant human beings who probably would have loved Islam more than us had they been shown the light. Wallahi. They probably would have been better Muslims. And I know so many reverts who are far stronger than born Muslims. And I know born Muslims who give up their deen. And I think that goes back to the narration or the verse of the Quran where Allah says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you are going to abandon your religion, we will replace you with someone else who will be more serious and they won't be like you. So Allah is trying to tell us, I don't actually need you, you need me. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's goodness and we ask Him to grant us goodness. <coughs> MashaAllah, we have the brothers and sisters who are seated here this evening. I'm sure all of you are trying very hard to pass your examinations. And Allah make it easy for you and grant you that degree and that passing, inshaAllah. We need to know one thing. You will leave a mark here. And you leave a mark in your own lives. When you leave university, when you leave you know, this part of your life, you will leave a mark where you were. And you leave a mark within your own life that at this time of my life I was at this place and this is what I did. So you will have about 10 points, main points that you could always be proud of. Let those points be points of goodness, not points of something that is bad. Many people leave and the only thing they can think about is, oh, I was introduced to drugs and varsity. Yeah, the first clubs I went to was at varsity. Oh, the alcohol, the first ones, the first little that I had was at varsity. Well, that's the highlights. That's the highlights. You're going to go, you're going to take them away. We'd rather say, and I know of so many, I turned to my deen when I was at varsity because I had good company. Wallahi, I know so many people who've turned to their deen at varsity. I'm sure the sisters here would agree. More, more sisters turn to, to deen in the varsity days when their eyes open to the reality than elsewhere. Believe me. And this is why the eye socks that are there, we need to be active. And we need to be good. And we need to... Not to label people and not to chase people away from the eye socks and not to make people, you know, categorize them. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to have big, big debates about the deen. No, we're here to encourage one another to be better Muslims whilst we are in these six years that we're going to be here. That's it. That's what I want to do here today. I'm not here to debate with you, brother. You're, you're Hanafi. Okay. Oh, no, you're Salafi. Wow. Okay. And you know what? You're not supposed to be here in the fall of Islam. You're, no, no. That's, a, that's haram. I don't want to talk about that. 
we want to try and say, develop your link with your maker. You study your deen, mashallah. But as a whole, we who are here at the varsity, we need to make sure when we leave, the points we have taken with us are the powerful points. I fought my temptations. It was not a good environment. It was so bad. But mashallah, I had, you know, sister so and so and so and so, or brother so and so and so and so who were with me, and they kept us going. We never missed a salah. Once in a while, we would talk together. We would study the deen. I actually learned how to read Quran when I was there. I was introduced to this and that. There were a few sisters who spoke Arabic. I sat with them and I learned a few words a day. And mashallah, now I can understand the Quran. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. This is now called achieving. But you've got to fight your temptations to do that. Because it's very, very easy to continue doing whatever comes to your mind. But will you achieve? That's the question. The answer is no, you don't achieve much. You do as you please, as your mind says. So your mind will say, oh, that's a handsome guy. Let me go and sit in his lap. So suddenly we in his lap. No one will say no. People will actually look at you and sit in someone else's lap. Mashallah. You know, nobody, the environment out there is pretty accepting of, of that type of behavior. But we're Muslim. We should be shy. Shy meaning, you know, modesty is a part of is a part of iman. Al haya shu'batum min al iman. To be modest is a part of iman, and this is why that is what keeps us away from doing this type of thing. What are we going to achieve? I can tell you. I, I can tell you from experience of people who've actually uh, gone through this, where you find yourself, mashallah, losing focus of what you were here for at varsity. And you end up, mashallah, dating someone. That's not what you came to varsity for. You know, if you really want to marry someone you've seen that really is a brilliant Muslim and for the right reasons, alhamdulillah, no one is saying that's wrong. But sometimes, you know, the environment shows you that someone is good when they really are not good because the things, you know, you see them as cool because they're cool with the, envi with the people that are around, yet it's not actually the religious environment, nor is it the environment that reflects your upbringing back at home. So they won't fit back at home, but they fit for as long as you're here at the varsity. So what happens is, mashallah, people start dating. Or should I say, a'udhu billah, people start dating. And then what happens is, after some time, Oh, the parents say that is very bad and they're all upset and we sent you to varsity and so you've got a problem with your parents. And next thing, you fought them all and you're still married. And then what happened is, it stopped working because now, oh, he's dating someone else whilst we married. Well, didn't you think of that? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And then what happened? Now I can't go back to my parents because they were against him. This is all consequence of something we chose to do. But we, were, we may have been free to do it, but we chose to do something. So use your brain and long-term thinking, not short-term. Think very hard. Life is not simple and easy. But when you're making the big, big decisions of life, you need to think very, very hard. I always tell the young boys and girls, and I'm, I'm repeating this with golden ink today here, your brain and your heart are two of the most powerful organs of your body. Do not give control of them to anybody. Never, ever. There you are. Did you hear what I said? You might not agree. It will come in handy one day, inshallah. <laughs> your brain and your heart are two of the most powerful organs of your body. If you have given someone complete control of them, they can really hurt you. Believe me. They can abuse you to the highest degree. The only one who should have ultimate supreme control of that is Allah. Your brain and your heart. Imagine you've given your heart away to someone whom you're just an option for. They've got another ten hearts in their hand, mashallah. It's happening. And they tell you, oh, you're the only one. That's, that's a line we learned when we were in high school. Oh, my. <laughs> See the laugh? MashaAllah. So we shouldn't do this. We should understand it's very tempting. You know, it sounds rosy. It sounds so nice and sweet. And it sounds, oh, you know, it's the in thing. Yeah, he's a big hunk. You know, MashaAllah. Big, strong, well built. Wow, I can imagine walking with my arm in his arm. Oh, that's, that's MashaAllah. That's what it is. Just like you have fought for that. MashaAllah, there are another 200 girls out there fighting for the same thing. So as tempting as it was, say, Ya Allah, grant me better. Allahu Akbar. Then what will happen? You might find a small, you know, little guy who's not that big, but he will honor you, respect you, and put you on a golden carpet and walk with you, and you won't regret it. Allah, I see you. The smaller guys are all happy. <laughs> so, I, I've tried to keep this talk as, as, uh, as plugged in as possible, considering the age group that we are speaking to, and try to keep it as relevant as possible to what may be going on around here. I've spoken about just a few points, 
and I hope and I pray that we've benefited, inshallah. Uh, we all know that there is so much happening across the globe. Do we just want to get sucked in? I normally tell people that, you know, uh, westernization is a massive cauldron. With hot oil in it, it dissolves every culture. You just throw in anything, it dissolves it. Everything gets caught in, dissolves. But there's one thing it doesn't dissolve, and that is Islam. It doesn't dissolve it. So we need to keep that identity, inshallah. And we need to be good Muslims. People have the wrong impression of Islam, that Islam is a bad religion, teaching, promoting hatred, and you know, promoting, and fighting, and killing, and so on. No. We need to improve that. We're living in a country that, mashallah, is so free that we're actually honored to be in this country. We're actually happy that we can sit you know, with our hijab and we can sit with so much freedom. Mashallah. Why then would we want to hate and cause a problem and you know, uh, cause this difficulty and create a problem of, of peace and security? No. We are peace-loving citizens, law-abiding citizens of the lands we live in. Alhamdulillah. And at the same time, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want Allah to be pleased with us. We make most of the opportunities we have been given. And inshallah, I hope and I pray that myself, as the days pass, I can become closer and closer to my maker and still enjoy the life. And the same applies with everyone else. May Allah grant you all the same. And may He grant the Ummah as well the same. Until we meet again, inshallah. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammadin wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Society and you guys are the students, um, so are we as the committee. Um, we really need to continue the sort of work that much of the committee has done today. Um, it's not easy, we, we take sort of a lot of our time, our um, efforts, and uh, commodities as well. Um, the best way that you guys can help us is continue to attend our events um, because that's what they're there for to serve you, but also to support us in that become members, um, we, you know, you, I'm sure all of you by now know what you get as a member, you get your freshers pack and you get your Quran and your travel mat and stuff like that, but these are really minor things, um, that's the sort of benefit, the, the superficial benefit you get, um, but by joining us, truly you help our society grow, you officially join the Ummah at Leeds University and your membership contribution will just continue to fund all these sorts of events. Um, and inshallah will benefit hundreds of students and uh, you'll receive the award for this inshallah um, and I just want to read out this quote and whatsoever you spend of anything in Allah's cause, cause he will replace it um, so yeah it says it already um, I want to open the floor to a question and answer That's okay. yeah um, so if any of you have a question um, raise your hand. Okay. Do you want to do you want to just stand up there and just project? Oh, I just want to ask. Um, not many people talk about it. It's just the idea of free mixing and like, just where does that go? Exactly. The the idea of intermingling and so on. Yeah. Beloved brother, there is an ideal in the Sharia, and then there is something that is the reality on the ground. The ideal is there should be a barrier between the males and the females, and that's the ideal. And we cannot change that, and we will never be able to change that. But if, if not, and sometimes you know we have to mix with people, I think on campus, uh, even in the lecture halls, you're probably sitting next to females and so on. You have to handle yourself with respect, just like if you're planted on, a, on an aircraft or somewhere and you happen to be sitting next to Miss Gaga, you know, you're going to have to sit next to her, to be honest with you, uh, even if you know, she might be completely nude, so to speak. And you'll have to obviously lower your gaze. You get a bigger reward, each other. But to be honest with you, uh, we're living in an environment where we have to handle ourselves responsibly according to the situation we find ourselves in, knowing the ideal. So we don't compromise the ideal. 
You know, today we're sitting here physically separated, meaning, meaning the, the sisters are on one side and the, 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 the brothers are on the other. Talking of it from a campus point of view, it's far better than what would happen within the lecture halls. Am I right? There you are. So, it, it's not a masjid sort of an environment and so on. Ideally, still, we, we could have had, uh, you know, a partition, so to speak. But the next best is to have them physically separated. And the next best is to have them, uh, you know, sitting with respect and so on. It depends. So, we, we, I'd like to answer that. Reminding one and all that there is an ideal, we don't compromise it, we should know what it is and we should strive to get to it. But for as long as we haven't got to it, we try our best to respect ourselves, inshallah. Jazakallah. I think that's one of the most moderate answers you'll ever hear. <laughs> the sisters, anyone? Yes? Question, sister, Jazakallah khair. The first one connected to gossiping and backbiting. The hadith says to mention your fellow Muslim with something behind their backs that had they been present, they would have disliked it. That is backbiting. So to mention the truth about someone behind their backs. The truth, it's not a lie. The truth behind their backs in such a way that had they been present, they would have not liked it. That is backbiting. Slander is when you're mentioning a lie behind their backs, that is slander. <coughs> Gossip is to carry tales, to want to know every detail of what happened. You know, in that house, the mother-in-law doesn't get along. You know, in that house there, you know, they cook this in the morning. You know, in that house there, they burnt the food. And you know, in this house, that is gossip, which means you're mentioning things that are completely irrelevant. You know, but if you're talking good about someone, that you know, mashallah, that brother, you know, he's achieved so much. He did his hip, but this, and he did this, and he did that, and that sister, mashallah, she was like this, and she transformed so much, mashallah. I think she's an, a role model for all of us. We have something to learn. That's not gossip. That's not backbiting. That is something good. Because that is encouraging people uh, to do good by example. Wallahu alam. I hope I've answered that first part of your question. The second question was more connected to, should I say, uh, leaning on the mercy of Allah to continue committing sin. Have I understood it? Which means, you know, let me tell you, a talk like this is a pep talk. I cannot mention all the points of temptation in a 40-minute in talk, half an hour talk, uh, but I've only said three or four points, but I know what it's done to me because it has an impact on me when I talk, and I normally have an intention, Ya Allah, I'm telling myself. So the people who are listening, I'm sure it will have a heart-to-heart -heart impact on them and it will make them feel like wanting to be a good Muslim by the will of Allah. But that is momentary. I always say every person at some stage in their lives and sometimes more than once in their lives, they want to leave their bad ways. They want to effect change. But that thought will come in your mind for a period of time, then it will go away. Whilst it is there, you must snap at it. Make hay whilst the sun shines. So, whilst you have that feeling, right, right now, I want to turn, I want to do good, I hold, do it now. You know, get it done now, because if you're going to go out there, the environment out there is hostile <coughs> once again. So what might happen is, you, see, you think to yourself, okay, I, inshallah, from tomorrow I'm going, to, I'm going to read my salah. From tomorrow. Why tomorrow? Why not now? N-O-W. Because now you're going to go outside, you're going to meet someone, you're going to sit until 2, 3 in the morning, and then come time of fajr, ah, tired. You knock that clock, when it rings, you say, I'm getting up now in 10 minutes, I still, there's still time for, you know, for the first lesson. That is typical of a human being who doesn't seize the opportunity of change when the feeling comes in. When you feel like you want to change, change at that moment. However, once you have a feeling, Ya Allah, forgive me, I've done wrong, and so on, 
My beloved sisters, the four conditions, obviously the lesson is for all of us, the sister asked the question. Four conditions of Tawbah. You need to admit your sin, you need to regret it, you need to ask for forgiveness, you need to promise that you will not do it again. Once those four conditions are met, you are forgiven, even if you happen to repeat the sin a thousand times. I hope you understood that. Because if you, if, if I say for example, I stole this. Oh, okay, let me not give you an example of stealing. Say for example, I... What can I say? Astaghfirullah. I don't want to say I. Okay, let's leave that. Say there was someone who drank a bit of alcohol, right? <laughs> Imagine if I said I, what it would have sounded like. <laughs> Allah, Allah. So someone drank alcohol, and then they say they really regret it. So that's number one. They regret it. They admit their sin. Oh, very bad. What I did is wrong. They've admitted it. Then they say, Ya Allah, forgive me. So they're asking for the forgiveness. Ah, ya Allah, I will never do it again. Three. And they were sincere in all four things. They are forgiven, wiped out, completely gone. You know that? Now, three weeks later, something happens and they meet David once again. Hi, Dave. What's up, man? Okay, he comes to the pub. He says, yeah, man. You know? So he goes with Dave to the pub and next thing, he drinks again. But whilst he was drinking, he never, he didn't think of it and so on. And immediately after that, he says, what? What did I do? <clears throat> Very bad. So he's regretting it. It's a big sin. He's admitting it. Oh no, Ya Allah, forgive me. I've done this sin. Ya Allah, forgive me. I'll never do it again. He's forgiven again. Because he's met the four conditions. The minute we're lacking in the four conditions, like a person commits adultery, and he regrets it, or she regrets it. Why did I do this? What did I achieve by it? What did, why? That's a sign of Iman. I told you that. It's a sign of Iman. When you regret something. And then they say, Ya Allah, this was very bad, you know. And I really regret it, you know. And I admit it's wrong, Ya Allah. Forgive me, Ya Allah. So three conditions are met. I'll never ever do it again. But in the back of your mind, mm, if I see her, maybe, you know, I don't know. Maybe, possibly, you know. There might, there's a chance. In that case, how can we be forgiven? There we are. So, so as long as the conditions are met, we're forgiven. When they're not met, we're playing with our own spirituality. I'm wording my words so carefully. SubhanAllah. I hope and I pray you understand what I'm saying. And I don't want to condemn. That's the whole purpose I'm here. I don't want to say one word that will discourage anyone who's seated here this evening. May Allah open our doors. So that's it, my sister. We need to make sure that we have all these four qualities each time. And Allah will forgive us. Even if it happens many, many times, for as long as we have four. The minute we don't have those four, we need to work on them. We need to learn to hate, to sin. And we need to learn to, to fight temptation. Have I done justice to your question? Yes. Brilliant, yes, you have hatred, envy, jealousy, malice, and that in your heart uh, against others. Now, what happens is there are two things. The quality of the heart, the quality of the heart is questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if it is an ingrained quality of the heart that results in your deterioration. So if you thought of committing a sin, it's a quality of the heart and the brain, you haven't yet committed, and you fought the temptation, did you know that fighting a temptation on its own is a reward? The hadith says, Man hamma bi sayyatin falam yaf'alha kutibat lahu hasan. Whoever wants to commit a sin but doesn't commit it because of Allah, it's written as a reward for them. And so one brother came to me a few years ago, I remember, youngster, he says, so can't I just want to commit all sins and then I say, yeah, yeah, Allah, I won't, you know, <laughs> so I can just receive free you. I said, but come on, man, be practical, you know. So, subhanAllah, you know, you get weird people who just say weird things sometimes and sometimes they just want to test you, I think. So, my dear sister, if that is the quality, then inshallah, you know, we get a reward for having fought the temptation. And, and then the hadith also continues to say, whoever intends to do a good deed and cannot do it for some reason, it's already written as a reward. And whoever intends to do a good deed and does it, it's multiplied for them tenfold to seven hundredfold and beyond, depending on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give them. And whoever plans to commit a sin and commits it, it's written as one sin. It's written as one sin. Then they need to repent. Now, what you're speaking about, envy, that's another type of a quality of the heart. Which means... It's something that results in your mind and your heart being toned and tuned in a negative way towards a fellow Muslim. 
you're answerable for that, and that is a quality that is dangerous. Inna al-hasad ya'kul al-hasanat kama ta'kul al-nar al-hatab. The hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, jealousy, hasad is jealousy, uh, it eats away your good deeds in the same way that fire eats away a dry log, you know, fuel. <coughs> so that means it's a quality of the heart, it's very bad. For as long as we have not allowed that internal quality to make us do something against the person, it will still remain between us and Allah. So I can be envious and jealous and I can be this and that. For as long as I have not really physically gone ahead and, you know, vented that or fulfilled it by cutting, blocking, lying, you know, doing something that has harmed them, I can still seek forgiveness between me and Allah alone and He will forgive me. Because I, I had the quality but I didn't allow it to get far. But the minute you have jealousy, that jealousy makes you to say, you know that sister, I, it happened to me when I was young, true example. A man, a boy came to me and says, hey, this guy said you're, you're a this and you're a that. You were at school, primary school. You're stupid and you're an idiot and you're a what and you're a what and big, big words and so on. And you know, we all had this little pride of ours, you know. So what happened is, he had a tape recorder. And I told him, yeah, that guy's stupid and he's an idiot and I'll give him a beating and I'll do this. And he was recording it. So he went to the other guy and he says, keep quiet. I just want you to listen to this recording. Listen to it. The guy heard it. So it seemed like I was the one who was swearing him. The introduction is not there. See? So he started swearing and, and saying the same thing. I'll beat him up. I'll do this. I'll do that. And he's an idiot. And you know, bigger words than that. But I can't say it. And what happened is, he recorded that. He came back to me and he says, Do you remember I was telling you about this guy swearing? He says, You want to hear it? I said, Yeah. He says, Here it is. <laughs> now, what's this? You've allowed this inner hatred to get to you to the degree that you make two people fight. If that's the case, it's not just between you and Allah. You now need to go to this person and say, look, I'm sorry. And mashallah, it happened. About 15 years later, the brother owned up and said, hey, you know what, this is what I did. And now we're all a group of friends, mashallah. They realize, you know, there's no point. So we ask Allah to open our doors. I hope I've answered that for you. Yes, the brothers? Yeah, it seems like you're the questioner today, mashallah. <laughs> um, if you go to a restaurant with mates and they sell alcohol, uh, look, I would not go there, not at all. And I can tell you why. The reason is, you see this glass, and, and, and for example, the plate. Uh, if there has been alcohol in here, it needs to be washed in a specific way before I, it can actually be used by me, number one. And the plate as well. If there are people eating pork and eating, uh, for example, uh, haram things, like say alcohol and so on, you know the saliva actually gets onto the plate and so on, you know, and, and uh, it becomes dirty of a certain height of dirt, and then they need to wash it in a specific way to render it tahir for me to be able to eat in it, that doesn't happen. So we might think, hey look, you know, I'm just ordering my seafood meal and that's fine. Uh, but in reality, it, it, it's called the broader contamination that renders it not acceptable for someone who's very strict about halal and haram to go there. If you know what I mean. Zakallah I've just told you what I would do basically because that's what I know. Allah I don't know your circumstances but I suggest you Try and understand what I've just said. Yes, sister. It's a very powerful point. If you didn't say your final question, that itself was a lecture, which means it was powerful, it was enough for us to learn something from. To say that, did you hear what the sister said? It was very powerful to say, we feel hypocritical, don't we? That look, I'm asking Allah just when I'm in need. But there's a difference between the ordinary humans and Allah. Allah loves you when you call out to Him. So He creates this type of you know, uh, need in you so that you can call out to Him. That was the example I was giving. And this is why not all of us are what I would call, you know, brainy or boffins and so on. Because if you're really extremely intelligent, sometimes you wouldn't even call out to Allah to say, hey, hang on, I know, you know. It's like Karun. Allah says, he was such a good businessman that he earned so much. And he says uh, that this is from me. You know, it's, Qala innama ala ilmin He says, hey, all this that I have here is because of the knowledge that I have. 
my business tactics and so on. And Allah says, hang on, we've destroyed for you. We show you. So, uh, my dear sister, the answer is no. It doesn't mean you should stop. You should carry on with Allah. And what you should do, spice up your life with spirituality. In the sense that, promise Allah to say, Ya Allah, at least the farad I will read. You know, so if you start with the farad alone, inshallah you develop to the sunnah and the nafil at some stage. But if we're not going to take the first step, how are we going to walk the man? So there are many brothers and sisters who feel that, you know, Allah doesn't love me. That's why I've repeated so many times in this talk, Allah loves every single one of us. No matter what has happened in the past, no matter what our condition is, we have an opportunity to turn to Allah and we have access to Him directly. So we need to seize that opportunity and consider the moments when you, you feel in need of Allah, moments of a gift of Allah upon you. When you feel you're in need of Allah, that's a moment that is really a gift of Allah upon you. You know, some people, Allahu Akbar, we can give so many examples, but that's the answer to your question. You don't stop, you continue, inshallah. And every time the exams come, you continue again. And inshallah, Allah will put more and more and more and more exams. Because sometimes if that's the only thing that's going to turn you, and Allah loves you, He's going to say, you know what, let me just keep this person in constant test. May Allah not do that to us. But if that's what's bringing us to Him, He might just well do that. Now, yes, sisters again, yes. Yes, that is a very, very uh, serious issue because I think most communities across the globe have been, you know, brought up backbiting. And people generally, even good people, have a problem of backbiting. And backbiting is a very, very serious crime. Uh, the solution to that is a little bit strict. You might have to hurt a few people in the process. I, I really don't know of a polite way uh, of a polite way of solving the problem. What I have done in the past, I'm just letting you know. Uh, I just got up, excused myself, salam alaikum, and walked out. So they might not know why exactly, but over a period of time they get to know this guy walks out. He walks out. It's like I, I was telling one of the brothers, mashallah, that you know, I don't like to sleep at a place that I don't trust and I don't like to eat anywhere besides my own home, you know. <coughs> why? I, I just don't know. It's just me. You know, I, I don't know. I don't condemn anyone, but it's just me. You know, try inviting me for a meal and you'll find exactly how I just dodge and dive. Somehow I just get out of it. Why? It's just me. I don't. I, I cannot, you know. I need to know someone and I need to know their whole history and their background and I need to make sure that they're genuine and so on. It's just me. It's not like I don't like someone. But to get away from that sometimes is very difficult. Now when it comes to backbiting, it's something much more serious. And <clears throat> do you know that backbiting is only possible with two parties? That is why the hearing party is as guilty as the one speaking. If it wasn't for your ears, they were not going to sit in front of the mirror and say, right, let me quickly tell you about that sister there. You know? They weren't going to do that. So you lent them the ear. That's why they spoke. Allahu Akbar. My beloved sister, we make dua for ourselves and for the rest of the ummah, inshallah. We ask Allah really to, to grant us ease. I haven't really given you a proper answer, but I've given you a direction, inshallah. I think we can have one more question, inshallah, and then we can call it a night, inshallah. Um, I just wanted to, you were talking about how um, Allah is the merciful, but um, when you said to him, when it involves other people, um, that's when you know, there's a bit of a problem. How do you go about um, seeking Dharma for, um, for example, if you've hurt another person and you've asked Allah for, for forgiveness, but this same example, if it happened a long time ago, or if it's just going to cause more problems by you kind of confronting them all? Okay, when I've, when I've uh, heard someone say I've backbitten about this brother, for example, uh, he may not know about it. So I know there are some scholars who say, oh, you know, you just ask Allah and so on, but no, it would have caused, especially when it's wrong. It's like rumor spreading more, where I've said, oh, this brother, this and that, and it's wrong. So many people have heard it, and many people have developed, uh, they have developed a uh, perception of this brother based on what I have said. It's my duty to start going one by one and clarifying, <coughs> number one, it's my duty. Uh, otherwise, I will have to face the matter on the day of Qiyamah, and I don't want to do that. So I need to go, look, brother, I, I said this about uh, this brother, but it was wrong. I, I was really wrong, and I, it was wrong for me to have, say, to have said this. And I need to try and undo the damage. Uh, and I, if I want, the quicker way is to go straight to the brother, look, brother, I'm sorry I said this about you, but I really didn't know, and I'm very, very sorry, and I want you to forgive me, please. And wallahi, he, he may say yes, he may say no, it's his right, and it's, it's yours as well. So if he says, okay, you're forgiven, Allah will then forgive you. 
And if he says no, you have to fight it out on the day of Qiyamah. But how some scholars have suggested, it's not actually from the hadith, but it's a suggestion that's just from the brain, and you can hear it and figure out whether you want to do it or not. They say, look, if you give out a charity, or two, or three, on behalf of this person, after they've refused to forgive you, so you've done a good deed on their behalf. So on the day of Qiyamah, they will see the damage that you did because of the backbiting, and they will see the good deeds on their, on, on their behalf that you've engaged in, and they will probably say, ah, okay, you know, let this guy off. That's not from the hadith. And this is why I cannot encourage that, but I can tell you I've heard people saying that. I don't know if it makes sense to people, but uh, sometimes it may be a way, Allahu A'lam. It's very dangerous, and this is why uh, I told you moments ago I don't judge books by their covers. One of the reasons is, Wallahi, there's a hadith. Atadruna man al Do you know who is the Do you know who is the uh, bankrupt person? And the, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, Well, he's a person that doesn't have any dirham or dinar, no money, no dollar or pound, so to speak. And the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, No, a, a bankrupt person is the one who has lots of salah, lots of zakah, lots of obedience, but they come on the day of Qiyamah, they have sworn this one, backbitten about this one, slandered about that one, eaten the wealth about, uh, of that one, and so on. So their salah goes to this one, their zakah goes to that one, their hajj goes to that one, they don't have any more good deeds to give, and there's still a lot of people whom they have wronged, so now the evil deeds of those people come onto this person, and they end up carrying the, the burden of the sins of those who, who have, whom they owe uh, to because of what they did, yet they had not committed those sins. So what is that all about? It's about backbiting. It's about slander. It's about cheating, deceiving. It's about all those things. So it's dangerous. We never know who's going to be in Jannah. You know, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. It's not simple, and it's something that's very, very dangerous. There are ulama who have given simple one-word answers, don't worry, just make dua to Allah. No. If you've wronged an individual, you've wronged someone who's not Allah, you need to go to them and ask them, hey, I've wronged you and I'm sorry. You need to develop the courage to do that. Now, Allah Akbar. A very good question that somebody's asked here, what is your advice for students, you know, to help them get up for Salatul Fajr? You see, Salatul Fajr is the most important Salah of the day. If you read Salatul Fajr, the rest of your day moves perfectly well. You feel good. Wallahi, try it out. Just try it. Get up early. Not last minute, you know, they call it the sunrise. Well, there's a name, I cannot say. Okay, the guys who get up just before sunrise and they're rushing, you know. And they say, okay, my Salah, you know, what's the time? Oh, the time, you know, the sun rises at 7.40, 7.39, Allah, 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 Allah. Let's not do it. Get up early, wash up, get ready, read your Salatul Fajr, pick the book that will take you to Jannah, which is the Quran, open it, read two verses. How many? Two verses. Only two. Look at the meaning, think about it for five minutes, close it, and then start doing what you have to. Wallahi, I guarantee you, your day will move perfect. That's a guarantee, and I've taken a qasam. You feel so good. You feel, you feel like Allah is so close to you through the whole day. Wallahi. But you've got to try it. And I'm not joking. You see the problem with us? We can hear, you know, art of living and yoga and, and we'll go and do this. <laughs> and then they say, can you feel? And you say, mm -hmm. <laughs> can you? And when someone says, read the Quran, we can't even sit with the Quran, but we'll sit with the books of yoga and the books of art of living and the books of, you know, all sorts of things of Reiki and what have you and these different types of, you know, breathing skills. And, but when someone tells you, Allah, you know, Allah has said this, just read the Quran, you know, read it with a beautiful tone, a tune, you know, uh, you, you're in your room and try reading it, you know, try putting, a, 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 you know, a rhyme, what can I say? Try giving it that, reciting it rather than just reading it. Reciting it with a melodious sort of a voice. Try it and see how, it, you might not be a pro at it, but between, no one else needs to hear. And see how you feel. You did it for the pleasure of Allah. Wallahi, your day will go right. And Allah says in the, in the Quran, that Quran, Quran here refers to a few things, but one of them also is, uh, you know, this Quran that we're talking about, the recitation and all that, it's witnessed by the angels. That which is read early morning, early morning is witnessed by the angels. It's much more blessed 
than that which is read at other times. So I hope this few words of motivation could actually have you know, answered this question to say we're trying to motivate, really, to get up for Salatul Fajr. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us. Do we come to an end with that, inshallah? Brother, I know you have a question. You can mail me, muftimenk at gmail.com, inshallah. You know, they might think, uh, I, I actually should reply, inshallah. If I don't, you send the mail back every day, inshallah. <laughs> the reason is, no, I'm not being sarcastic. You know, if you're just a one human being, you set aside about an hour or two for responding to mails. If you get about 800 mails a day, inshallah, you can reply the first 80, inshallah. So, so basically, it, it will, inshallah. And normally, if, if the subject is written in a, in a dignified manner, you pick it out before the others. If it's an FW, it just goes straight to the box, you know, trash can. So, inshallah. Uh, I, I think I really hope and pray that whatever I've said has, you know, been taken in in the correct context. I told you my aim when I started here was to make us feel like we're all part of one big family, inshallah. I feel that. And I really believe that we are part of one big family, inshallah. And so, please, uh, if I can be of any help, you can always mail me. And inshallah, you can always learn from one another. And let's try and spend our days wisely and earn the pleasure of our Maker before we get back to Him. Until we meet again, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.